Hello, and welcome to this presentation on designing assemblies with Solid Edge. I'm Cam McCasson, and in this presentation, I'm going to demonstrate one workflow for creating assemblies with Solid Edge, and a few things you can do in Solid Edge with a complete model. If I'm successful, by the end of this presentation, you will know how to create parts and assemblies in place, manage material properties with ST7, use and manage assembly constraints, use the replace part commands, modify parts with synchronous, create and manipulate part and subassembly patterns, use Keyshot to produce model renderings, and create both assembly animations and assembly explosion animations with Solid Edge and Keyshot. Let's begin. I figure the best way to demonstrate modeling an assembly is to model an assembly. I have seen several people with 3D printed strand beasts, and this seems like a perfect excuse to get around to modeling something for myself. Starting out, I knew I wanted two leg assemblies to use in a little strand beast robot, something like the picture. I also knew that I would use Acuity's FDM 3D printer to print them. Our 3D printer isn't big enough to print the whole assembly, so I want to print the assembly in smaller pieces. I also want to be able to get away with as few legs as possible, but have the option to easily add more without reprinting the entire assembly. Other than that, I had only a rough idea of part dimensions. I started by creating an assembly and saving it. Then I immediately used the Create Part in Place tool to create the first part. The Create Part in Place tool allows you to create a new part or assembly file and position the new file's origin in the current assembly. The new file's origin can be created coincident with the assembly origin, offset from the assembly origin, or by graphic input. We'll cover all three in this presentation. I created the first part coincident with the assembly origin. For my first part, I modeled a simple camshaft. I decided to go ahead and assign it material properties even though I knew I would have plenty of changes to make later. In ST7, a material node appears above the feature tree, right clicking it will open the recent materials menu, and at the bottom you can open the full material table, which will allow you to see the model's current material properties as well as select new ones. The material table also allows you to configure a material's appearance. Then I saved and exited the part environment, and constrained the part in the assembly environment, which I will demonstrate now with a new assembly. But before I do, I want to point out using a more complex example, existing assembly constraints that affect a part or subassembly will be listed in their own tree underneath the part tree when you select the part in question. For this new assembly, I'll pull a camshaft out of the parts library. Since there are no other parts in this assembly, Solid Edge will place the first part with the part origin coincident to the assembly origin, and with an established grounded constraint. So first, I have to delete that constraint and create new ones. I want to constrain the shaft's axis of rotation to the assembly's y-axis. Then I'll make a planar face to the assembly's xz reference plane. Now the shaft can rotate, but is otherwise constrained. I'll place and constrain the second camshaft using flash fit with the assemble command. Flash fit is the default constraint option when the assemble command is launched. Flash fit automatically determines the type of constraint to apply based on the faces selected. Once I had my camshafts modeled, placed, and constrained in the assembly, I used the create part and place command with an origin offset from the assembly origin to create my next part. Notice, this time when I go to assign material properties to my new part, ABS appears in the recent materials list. You can also click manage favorite and recent materials to manually configure the recent materials list. Next, I'll show you how to create and configure patterns of parts or sub-assemblies in an assembly. First, I'll grab the part to be patterned from the part library and constrain it.
Now I'll create a sketch with a pattern feature in the assembly. I can place my pattern precisely by including some geometry from parts of the assembly. The rectangular pattern tool works similarly to sketching a box by two points, but with extra parameter fields to specify the pattern fill type and number of X and Y pattern occurrences. Each green dot represents a pattern occurrence. Now I can finish the sketch and create the part pattern. Simply select the seed part, the type of pattern, the pattern source, and the actual pattern, then you're done. To manipulate the pattern, edit the pattern feature in the pattern sketch. Once I had my main structure laid out, I used the create part in place command to create a new assembly, or in this case, sub-assembly, with its origin placed based on sketch geometry in the top level assembly. I then opened the new leg sub-assembly and used the create part in place command again to create the first part in the leg sub-assembly. At this point, neither the sub-assembly or the new part is constrained relative to each other or the top level assembly. I chose to constrain the origin of the new part to the z-axis and xy-plane of the subassembly, and then modeled the part, but you are free to model the part and then create your constraints. In ST7, constraints can be created between parts of a subassembly and parts of a top-level assembly, or other subassemblies in the same top-level assembly, by holding the shift key when selecting the geometry from outside the current subassembly. However, if you intend to have multiple instances of a subassembly, you should avoid creating constraints to parts outside the subassembly, otherwise you'll have to repair those constraints when you add new instances of the subassembly to your top level assembly. I quickly modeled some basic parts to help me work out the overall geometry of the legs. At this point, I didn't bother modeling how the parts would fit together. Note, for a subassembly to move in the top level assembly, it must be set as an adjustable assembly. However, adjustable assemblies cannot be edited in place, so you have to choose between switching the part back and forth between an adjustable assembly and a rigid assembly, or right-clicking on the adjustable part and selecting Open rather than Edit in Place. I use whichever approach seems more convenient at the time. Once I finished the leg, I decided I needed to increase the lift of the camshaft, then I modified the actuating linkages to accommodate. I also decided to change the shape of the cutout where the linkage is supposed to snap onto the claw, and created a quick animation to see what it all looked like. To create a simple assembly animation, first make sure you have all your parts appropriately constrained, and sub-assemblies you expect to move set as adjustable assemblies. Remember, you can pause and right-click to bring up the quick pick menu when you have trouble clicking on the intended geometry. Once your assembly is ready, select the desired motor command from the ribbon bar. Select the part you want to move and axis you want it to move on. You can flip the direction, specify a speed, a limit, and a name. Next, click the Simulate Motors button. You can also launch the animation editor from the ERA environment. After you open the simulation editor, you will need to add the motor to the animation with a specified duration.
playing the animation with the screen capture running is a little choppy. You can export animations from Solid Edge using the Save to Movie button in the Animation Editor, or in ST7 you can launch Keyshot to produce a high quality animation rendering. Here's a walking animation I exported from Solid Edge. We'll cover Keyshot animations at the end of the video. At this point I decided I was comfortable with the width of the leg assembly and updated the camshaft model. To update the legs, I used the replace part with copy command to create a new copy of the leg assembly, and then opened the assembly and used the replace part with copy command to make new copies of all the parts, and then I went about modeling how the legs would actually assemble. Once I finished the updated leg assembly, I saved and closed it. Then in the top level assembly, use the replace part command to replace the old leg assemblies with the new one. Since I didn't significantly alter the geometry I used to make the top level assembly constraints, the new legs drop in and adopt the old legs constraints. After I had my first detailed assembly modeled, I took some time to measure different parts with the smart measure command to make sure everything should print, and decided I needed a smaller cutout in the actuating linkages of the leg assemblies. Unfortunately, I modeled the cutout as part of the original extrusion, so no cutout feature appeared in the feature tree. Lucky for me, with Synchronous, I can select the faces of the cutout and use the Detach command to remove the cutout. I then can delete the detached faces. Somewhat confident I wouldn't have to make any more unexpected changes, I went back and added detail features to everything. I decided to launch the ERA environment and create an assembly explosion view. The legs themselves print assembled, so I used the bind command to identify each leg as a complete explosion unit. Multiple explosion views can be created and saved as different configurations. Be sure before launching the animation editor to save your new explosion configuration, otherwise you cannot define the explosion in the animation. First launch the ERA environment. Then use the bind command on any subassemblies you don't want exploded. I'll make this a multi-staged explosion, first exploding the halves apart, and then exploding one half all the way. After selecting the parts you want exploded, select the part and then the face you want to explode from. For the first half, I want to select move as unit. I want the camshaft to explode down. And then I'll explode the remainder of this half using the spread evenly option. When exploding a group of parts from each other, you should try to select parts in the order you want them to explode, but you can also control the order manually. Before you launch the animation editor, create a new configuration and name it. Then open the animation editor, and in the animation editor window, right click on the explosion configuration and select edit definition. Set the animation's initial state and event timing, then click OK. I want to touch real quick on Keyshot with Solid Edge ST7. Keyshot deserves a presentation of its own, so for now I just want to do a simple demonstration of creating a Keyshot rendering of a Solid Edge ST7 animation. If you want to learn more, there are tutorials and demonstrations available at keyshot.com learning. I'm going to use the walking animation we created earlier. To open your animation with Keyshot, just click the Keyshot Animate button. Configure your output options and select OK. 
Generating the animation can take a while. We could go straight to rendering the animation, but instead let's use Keyshot to add a turntable effect. Just open the animation wizard and select turntable, select next, and then choose the model. Now you can parameterize your turntable animation. And last, click finish. You can preview the animation in Keyshot. To render the animation, click the render icon and then click the animation button and configure the rendering. You'll need to choose a video output name and location. You can also choose to output the individual frames from your animation. The quality window allows you to manually configure the rendering quality or configure the rendering automatically based on a time limit or number of samples. Keyshot is a CPU-based rendering program, so for reference, this animation took my computer running an Intel i5 2.8GHz dual-core 3.5 hours to render. There is certainly a lot more to Keyshot. Again, I would recommend anyone eager to learn more view the Keyshot tutorials at keyshot.com learning. Before printing the first prototype parts, I used my printer software to see if there were any obvious faults, and found the end of the clip on the lower actuating linkage was too small for my printer, so I modified it. It looks like the legs should print, but before I print one I want to try increasing the effective stride by increasing the lift on the camshaft. If you're curious to see how it turns out, check out our blog at acuityinc.com blog and sign up for our newsletter. I'll do a write-up and some possible follow-up videos once I have something walking. Thank you for watching this presentation on designing assemblies with Solid Edge. If you have any questions regarding the presentation or Solid Edge, please contact us or feel free to ask your question in the comments section below.